This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Golf's second major of the year is on tap this weekend at Valhalla Golf Club. It is the PGA Championship and a lot of good storylines entering this one. Scotty Scheffler in elite, impeccable form right now, coming off the birth of his first child. Rory McIlroy, a winner last week, going back to the course where he got his last major win a decade ago this year. Doesn't get any better than that. We're going to break down the PGA Championship today by talking to Brandon Gadula, getting his read on the favorite bets he likes over at FanDuel Sportsbook, the golf course, and much more to get you ready for this week. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Joined here, as mentioned by Brandon Gadula. Check him out on Twitter at Gadula13. He is a senior managing editor for FanDuel Research. Brandon PGA Championship is coming up this week. How you doing? I'm great. It's major week. What's there to What's there to complain about? I mean, it doesn't get any better than this though. Like I know the Masters is like the best major, but the storylines for this week are like chef's kiss, right? Yeah, I think there's a lot. Um, with you mentioned Rory Scheffler. Uh, the team live is kind of in an interesting position uh, across the board in a lot of ways. Um, Justin Thomas kind of like the hometown ish local narrative as well. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of, a lot of interesting storylines. Uh, I mean, I would throw like Xander Shoffle in there, whether he can finally turn the math into a win, which I'll talk more about uh, in a bit, but, Kind of across the board, I envision Sunday being fun unless yeah. Scotty Scheffler just comes out and reminds us like, oh, yeah, it's been a couple weeks, but nobody can touch Scotty Scheffler. So we'll see. Yeah. Uh, and the betting markets are making sure you can't touch him without paying a cost because he is four to one to win this week. Rory is plus seven fifty two, So that's not short either. So we'll talk about those two guys. Talk about Valhalla and Brandon's favorite bets at FanDuel Sportsbook in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast, because it is a massive week in the sporting world, not just the PGA Championship, but also NBA and Stanley Cup playoffs continue on. We'll have Tom Vecchio on tomorrow to break down those. Then on Thursday, we're going to Todd Shrupp of FanDuel TV on to preview the Preakness stakes. He'll break down his favorite horses for this weekend at the Preakness to get you ready for that as well. All those shows right here on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. Search for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. Hit subscribe, and if you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating and review. And, of course, you can find the show on the FanDuel YouTube page. And FanDuel TV Plus as well. So later on today, we're going to have a, another PGA show breaking down top bets and DFS plays as well for the PGA Championship. If you want that, that's on the FanDuel Research Podcast feed with the two of us back there again as well. I'll give my thoughts on uh, the betting board and DFS plays as well. FanDuel Research Podcast that will also be on the FanDuel YouTube page and FanDuel TV Plus for this week. Golf's second major is here, and you can bet on who you think will go home with the hardware on FanDuel right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 bucks to use an outright winners, finishing position including ties, longest drives, and so much more. Plus, you get paid instantly. When you bring up a major win this major season, so don't wait. Download America's number one sports book and swing for some green. Must be 21 plus or 18 plus in DC and president select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, D.C., Illinois, Iowa, Kentucky, Michigan, New Jersey, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Vermont, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777. Or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9 with it in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700. Visit chaosgamblinghealth.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit MD Gambling Health Oregon, Maryland, 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia, 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org. 
or call 800 for 24 7 support in Massachusetts or call 1 877 Hope and Y or text Hope and Y in New York. Now, before we talk about the field for this week, Brandon, let's talk about Valhalla Golf Club, the host of this year's PGA Championship, hosted three previous PGA Championships, lengthened a bit since then. Not as much as the golfers have lengthened. So, like, you know, it's it's a lengthening, but, you know, people are longer now than they were back in 2014, too. So what should we know about this course for this week? Yeah, I think that length, though, is a big uh, note here. It's one of the things that stands out just more than pretty much anything else. There's obviously limited data to go off of with just the one PGA Championship uh, back in 2014 with shot length data, but... It's over 7,600 yards, uh, so super long par 71. It's the third longest course so far this season on the PGA Tour. And really, you will you might hear this a good bit, and I think it's for a good reason, but pretty similar to Quail Hollow in terms of you know just the overall vibe set up, what, what matters, uh, which is interesting because Rory McIlroy just won, you know, won here back in 2014. So I think that's playing part in why he is uh, plus 750 on FanDuel Sportsbook this week. But... Sticking to the course uh, for now, I think there are going to be a lot of additional approach shots um, from 200 plus yards. That's what the data golf course fit uh, tool is showing. I think it definitely makes sense if you look at the course, if you break it down hole by hole uh, in terms of the length of each particular hole compared to like your average uh, hole at relative to par. Uh, dig, be- dig more into that here in a second, but smaller greens as well uh 5000 square feet on average uh pg tour average is usually just over 6000 square feet so you know a noticeable uh downshift there and we're back on bent grass uh for just the i think the third time this season actually um but you know small greens long course that alone tells you you have to be a good ball striker uh to contend here um, I will just mention too that the PGA Championship in 2014 was held in August. I'm not putting a whole lot of stock into who played well here 10 years ago uh, mm-hmm. in August. Just kind of wanted to get that out there. But um, sticking back with the course, if we want to dig in, try to glean anything from how it played in 2014, if you compare like correlations for strokes gain numbers uh, across the board what mattered how the best players that week overall fared uh what you see is that there was more correlation with strokes gained off the tee than usual on the pga tour and actually a little bit of a lower correlation with approach but if you kind of look at the best iron players that week uh the ones who gained the most strokes from approach kind of didn't have the rest of their game so i don't want to i don't want to look at that and say that approach play is not important here it's going to be very very important um this week Around the green play was down across the board, putting about the same as your average setup. So basically what this tells me is that we need driving distance. That was a huge uh, deviation from the tour average with accuracy gone the opposite direction, again, based just on uh, 2014. But I mentioned this too, and this this goes along with the distance. If you you look at this from a hole by hole standpoint, seven holes are at least 110% of like the whole average. So about 10% longer than your average. Uh, There are six really long par fours. There's a par three that's going to play over 250. Um, And there's not a lot like of giving back. There are two par fours under 400 yards, one of them being the 13th, which is an island green. So you're going to have, you're going to benefit from hitting it longer. That's never the most fun. I I think a lot, I guess a lot of people do like to watch it, but for me, I don't like when it's, there's such an emphasis on distance, but I think this week, what we're going to need is distance off the tee, great approach play, especially longer approaches. Um, You can look up those stats on PGA tour. Uh, Data golf has some approach uh, distribution numbers as well and putting. So I want driver irons and putting, if I'm looking for a weakness, it's okay if it's around the green uh, this week for me. Now, you mentioned it's similar to Quail Hollow, and you alluded to the fact that Rory McIlroy did just win there this past week. And so let's talk about him and Scotty Scheffler, because Scotty Scheffler was on a tear before taking a brief break to uh, be at the birth of his first child. And then Rory won the team play event with, with Shane Lowry and then won again at Quail Hollow this past week. And again, site of his past or his most recent major win. So Scheffler for four to one, Rory plus seven fifty. 
How are you viewing those two guys at very short odds in a big field? Yeah, it's tricky. Um, you know, Scheffler's won four of his last five starts. His non-win was a T2 at the Houston Open. Uh, his wife, Meredith, did give birth. So the withdrawal concerns that were kind of lingering at the end of last month should be drastically down. I don't want to say that they're zero. I don't know. But uh, that was one thing that that's kind of the only sort of narrative you could have uh, right. against Scheffler. And that shouldn't be much of an issue. If you look over the last three months, we want to talk like current form. Uh, Scheffler is averaging 3.93 true strokes gain per round according to data golf so that's that's field strength adjusted strokes gained so he'd be like an average male professional golfer by about four shots per round if they played like to their long-term at or their their average over three months which is just wild to think about but for even more context in that sample that three-month sample xander shoffley is next up at a 2.87 so scheffler is a better than a shot better than everyone else like or anyone else, I should say, not even everyone else. Because he said when he's up by four, that's kind of like the uh, not the expectation, but like it's a very realistic outcome. Oh yeah. So basically, if they played to their averages over the last three months this weekend, Sheffer is going to beat everyone by four or more. <laughs> and only Hideki Matsuyama in that span is above a two point five. That's just how good Sheffer has been. And this does factor in the putting, which is definitely trending up, but it's still not necessarily his strength. That's just how good he is. Uh, T to green, as you mentioned too, with Rory winning the Zurich along with Shane Lowry, then winning, uh, you know, at Quail Hollow last week, the Wells Fargo with a dominant Sunday. He's at a 2.19 uh, stroke gained over the last three months. I have Scheffler when I model this out around plus 425. As you mentioned, you you know you're going to have to pay a premium to get there. I. I don't think it's egregious uh, for Scheffler to go out and win this thing with how good he is and and with the putter being what it is now. But for Rory, uh, my model, which accounts for long-term history, field strength, it in, and it does uh, weight in more recent rounds for sure, which should help Rory. It still has him around plus 1,300. I understand why he is plus 750 sure. when you factor in this more subjective, the the win last week, the win 10 years ago. I get it. I'm not quite there. Although last week he was dominant top 10 in all four strokes gained uh, categories last week in his win. He was first in strokes gained off the tee. If given a choice between the two, I'm, I would still go Scheffler, even though his odds are effectively half of what Rory's are. I just see more of a case for, for Scheffler who again is not that far off from me, which has kind of been the case. And I should have, yeah. I should just be getting there a little bit more frequently. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're in phenomenal form right now. Yeah, there are, their odds are where they are for a reason, but that doesn't mean we have to bet them. Um, yeah. Like we can say, you know, hat tip to them, full respect to them. I'm okay. Looking elsewhere. So speaking of looking <laughs> sure. elsewhere, Brandon, any second tier golfers you like for outrights this week? Yeah, I got two kind of, uh, different golfers at the same odds and everyone's feel everyone can ignore me on this one, but I'm going to beat the drum for Xander Schauffele at 14 to one. Uh, everything. If you look at the, the math regression, just the stats, everything points to Xander breaking through eventually. And I, I mentioned he's second to Scotty Scheffler over the last three months in adjusted strokes gained average. Uh, he has four top 20s in his last five PGA championships. Uh, I mentioned this already, but data golf is showing an added emphasis on approach shots from 200 plus yards. Xander is gaining 0.128 strokes gained per shot from over 200 yards over the last 12 months. So a 0.128 and nobody else is even a 0.1. He is really dialed in from that distance. He is gaining club head speed, ball speed. His distance is up this season. I talk about putting regression a lot. He is an 89th percentile putter from within 15 feet this season, which is those sort of more makeable putts, those ones you can control. 10th percentile from outside 15 feet, which means he's not getting anything to fall 
but we know that long term he is honestly one of the best putters on the planet and he's putting really well this season. So he's a top 10 regress- regression candidate with the putter this season. My model shows value on Xander. Um, if you, I understand it if you don't want to get there at 14 to one, if you just, if, if you look at Xander and you say he doesn't have it, I get it. I kind of don't get it, but I get it. Um, but there's also other ways uh, you can get access to Xander, including a top 10 of plus 140. Uh, that's a, that's actually a no laying up special this week. So oh. shout out to, uh, to Sully on that one. I think that's his, um, there's a whole tab. They're they're great. No laying up. These guys make golf uh, fun. Uh, they're going to do some some TV coverage as well. So check them out. Uh, glad to have them up on the FanDuel Sports book. But there's also Xander to win without Scotty Scheffler. That's eleven to one. I have him right there as well. I don't I don't hate. I know we're talking outrights here, but I'm going to shout out those two alternative markets uh, for Xander. Yeah, the no laying up specials are on FanDuel Sportsbook. Uh, the second tab over, if you're on the PGA Championship tab, it has a lot of uh, feature bets from the hosts on the no laying up podcast. But on Xander, I think the biggest criticism of him that you could have, the biggest legitimate criticism is that he's not as volatile as a Rory because Rory can have those massive spike weeks. But that volatility increases the longer he gets off the tee. And he's been getting, like you said, a lot longer. So I think that you can have a fair criticism of like the volatility not being like he can't like you're talking about Scotty, you know, or Rory last week was like plus 5.8 true strokes gained. Yeah. Xander doesn't have a lot of those weeks, but he's had more of those like pop weeks recently than he's had in the past. So I think that maybe the criticism of like Xander, like, not being volatile enough was more valid in the past than it is right now. So I've been annoyed with Xander recently, like getting, you know, fed up with like betting this guy and it never coming through, but I bet him this week to win because I think that volatility angle is less true now than it was before. Do you think that's a fair way to phrase it where I think that like the volatility is the reason he hasn't broken through, but that volatility is becoming less of a, an anchor on him now. Yeah, I do look at standard deviations and Mm -hmm. that's basically just mathematical volatility. And Xander always kind of stood out as like, okay, this is partially why he's not winning. Um, But, you know, it's not like he's never won. It's like he never, ever wins. When you get into when you get into contention and things start falling your way, that's what it takes. And frankly, there are golfers who have won more than they should. And there are golfers who have won way less than they should. And we know where Xander falls in that. But you, you look back at the math, you say, okay, he's longer off the tee now. That should lead to more volatility, more opportunities. The putting regression, it's a very real thing. So I'm not saying it all hits this week, but if you if you put, like if you blanked out Xander's name, and I, I read you all of these things, best golfer over the last uh, calendar year from 200 plus, and we know it's a long course, top 10 putter, all these things you'd say, sure, I'll take that. And then if you're like, Oh, Xander, this guy can't, he doesn't have it again. I understand it, but I, but I also don't, um, in terms of just the, the math and how things go. But if you're worried about Xander and someone who is unable to, to, it just hasn't proven that he can win. I got another name that I'm also in on at 14 to one. And it's basically just the complete opposite case to be made that you make for Xander. Uh, all of the math and sustainability points to Xander being a great process play. There's Scotty Scheffler, who, again, maybe he just wins it again, and this is all whatever. And I don't think it's egregious uh, if you're in on Scotty at 4-1, to one, but there's Brooks Kepka. He's got three PGA championships already. Last year's win uh, came off of a he, – he entered with a solo third and a fifth on the Live Tour. This year he's coming in with a T9 and a two-shot victory over his last two – he was T15 here in 2014 for what that's worth. Um, he's just hard to like, it's hard to get there with Brooks anytime you model anything, but that was always the case, even when he was a full time PGA Tour player, because his volatility was kind of high, but not as high as you would think. But it was whenever he got into these majors that obviously it's just a different caliber, it's sort of a different animal. Uh, with Brooks, you know that he has the length. He's still showing length on the lift tour. We don't have great stats there, but he's got the length. We know the irons are there. Um, 
he played if you want to go the the quail hollow comp and this also works for xander if you want to say that they're similar courses i mean xander played plays quail hollow well so did uh so is brooks he was t13 in the pga championship um in 2017 uh t42 at the wells fargo the following year just missed a lot of fairways but everything else was pretty good so again if if you don't see it with xander i think you can see it probably with brooks uh probably two of the most different golfers we have right now uh but i think that there's value on both frankly if you're picking one between those two guys what's your preference um they're like complete opposite processes but I would be okay going Brooks there if I could just okay. pick one. I'd probably pick Xander personally. I, um, I, sh- I, my, yeah, my head says Xander, but my heart actually says Brooks because of the broken narrative of of wins and converting wins and everything. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, like you want volatility, just go Brooks. So I get it. Um, I, I understand it, but I would probably go uh, Xander personally there. What about any longer shots? You know, maybe not necessarily like long shots, but like yeah. guys longer than this you're eyeing this week. Uh, I think another live name with Joaquin Neiman at 35 to one on FanDuel Sportsbook since March, he has a win in four top tens on the live tour. He was T 22 at the masters, but he lost strokes putting. He was top 20 though, in both of the ball striking stats. So strokes gained off the tee and strokes gained approach against the masters field top 20 in each of those. We know he's long off the tee. That's basically the overarching narrative for me this week because I need to see some distance, and he has that. The form's there. Uh, a lot of people liked him for the Masters. He was really trending up. I think that form is still kind of there, but a lot of the hype has died off. Uh, so Neiman at 35-1, to 1, good process play, but also someone that my model likes. Uh, I don't mind a couple of other names in the mid-range, but I want to make sure that if I'm going with Xander and Brooks, because you asked me one or the other, I'm going both. Okay. Um, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, I, I recommended both. I'm going both. Like, no, I'm, yeah, I'm I, with that. I agree with that. That's fine. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't want to, you know, just start peppering the the 30, yeah. to t- like 20, 30 range as well. But I like Neiman. Uh, and although there are other names, I'm not going to throw them all out there. I, I do think that Sahith Tagala makes some sense at 75 to 1. Probably more of a partial unit at these odds against such a stacked field. This field's really phenomenal, but he's 90, uh, 90th percentile in approaches from 200 plus yards this uh, past calendar year in terms of strokes gained per shot. He's also long off the tee. He's a great iron player and he's a great putter. Uh, I have him around like 68 to one when I just model this out. So I, I see some value there with the model. But again, it's that process. And frankly, you want to talk volatility, someone who can put it together and just hasn't necessarily broken through. Sahith is, it shouldn't, it shouldn't surprise anyone if, if Sahith is in the final pairing, you know, just top five, top six going into the weekend, anything like that, uh, because he has that in his, in his uh, toolkit. Okay, so Brandon is on Joaquin Neiman 35 to 1. I am on board with that as well. And then Sa Thigala is 75 to 1. What about non outrights? What are you seeing there for this week? I keep going back to some of these live names, but I just I see it this week. Uh Bryson DeChambeau, top 10 at plus 260. Uh we know that the length is going to be there uh for Bryson. Uh, and if you want to go with the Quail Hollow comps, I think it checks out too. Missed the cut in 2016. T33 at the PGA Championship in 2017, fourth in 2018, and T9 in 2021. So just to circle back there, basically 33rd and two top 10s over his last three starts at a, at a very comparable course. Uh, honestly, may, may have had two wins there if he put it all together, if you kind of go event by event, you know, make some excuses, et cetera. Now, if you look at like the form, it's it's a little bit, Probably not where you want it to be. Yes, he's got two top 30s in his last two, but that's on the live tour. Um, at Singapore, he played pretty consistently, but didn't really spike. And then uh, Adelaide shot a 73, I think, in the first round, but then I want to say 66, 69. I had it up, but then I closed it. Um, what about the fourth so, round, Brandon? What do you do there? <laughs> well, we don't uh, we don't know. I think we can just impute uh, some data um, on that one. So I had this backwards at Adelaide 68, 68, 70. So just didn't do enough to stand out. And then at Singapore 73, but 66, uh, the next round 
and a 69. So I, I think that it, like the form is still there. Don't look at just the finishes I, with the live tour. You never know. Um, but digging through, uh, looking for that volatility seeing, and again, there's only three rounds. So if you have one bad round, you're not going to win. You're not going to finish great, but uh, I'm not going to put too much stock into that one round. So uh, Bryson for me, top 10 at plus 260, I think makes sense. And then really like, I'll, I'll call Sawhith a stud. I have no, I have no issues with that. Really, the only like non-stud that that I'm actually recommending this week uh, is going to be Patrick Rogers, who I'm sure you'll fight me over saying he's a stud because I know <laughs> I know you like him. But uh, top twenty is plus six fifty. Anytime on the PGA Tour, when we're looking at a course where distance matters, we tend to give a look to Patrick Rogers. He's thirty first in this field over the last fifty rounds. Uh, top sixty in strokes and Tita Green. Um, according to data golf, I know that doesn't like jump off the page, but when I model this one out, I see some value on Rogers. He's also due for some putting regression, which I always like. And really for like the top 20 numbers, you know, that's especially where I like to look and see who's due for putting regression, et cetera, to sort of back up, uh, you know, these, these longer odds for top twenties, because they're not going to get maybe as much attention it was T29 at last year's PGA as well. T29 again. Uh, the Wells Fargo last week uh, and T5 at RBC Heritage recently as well. So I think he's a little bit undervalued here. If you want to get access to a pretty long number for just a top 20, I think Patrick Rogers does enough for me this week. Okay. So those were Bryson DeChambeau uh, top 10 at plus 260 and Patrick Rogers top 20 at plus 650. I do want to mention uh, FanDuel also has the option to bet where dead heat rules don't apply. It's the top X position, including ties. So it's a shorter number, but you're not paying dead heat rules. Personally, I think that that I would rather go with the dead heat rules. Um, just my personal thoughts there. But uh, I, I you do have that option if you don't want to deal with the frustration of dead heat rules. You can go there out for FanDuel Sportsbook this week. I also, um, you said I might push back on Patrick Rogers being a stud. I did bet him top 10, 18 to 1. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Am I that predictable? I had a feeling. Is it, is, is it that? Am I that predictable? I had a feeling. I mean, okay. look, it makes sense. It's it's the distance. He's not a great iron player, but he's not not dreadful or anything. Just kind of, I would be, I would prefer a top twenty for him in a field this good. But it's okay. You can hate him. That's fine. Hater. Yeah, it's, it's fine. It's, I get it. I get it. You know, be a hater. It's okay. All right. That is all that we have here for today here on covering the spread. As mentioned, though, Brandon back with me later on today on the heat check on the FanDuel research podcast, breaking down top bets and DFS plays for the PGA championship. Check that out on the FanDuel research podcast feed, FanDuel TV plus and the FanDuel YouTube page of Brandon. Thank you for the time for today. Appreciate it as always. Good luck to you. Good luck to Xander. Hopefully getting the monkey off his back for this week because i would love to see that personally monetarily uh but also just for him uh, as a human being as well brandon appreciate it as always and talk to you again soon thanks for having me on all righty find brandon on twitter at kadula 13 i am on twitter at jim sonis you can also find fanduel research on twitter at fanduel research tomorrow here on the show tom vecchia swings by talking some pga not pga nba and nhl uh we'll talk to him then and then todd shrupp of fanduel tv on thursday to break down the preakness stakes we'll talk to all you then this has been covering the spread right here on the fanduel podcast network 